Flexical semantics. What we talk about when we talk about meaning. I want to turn now to lexical meaning and a contrast that's often made. Now, when we're talking about this, we're talking mostly about informational meaning. And the division that's often made is between sense and reference. Sense is the mental conception of a word's meaning. It's how we can think of the word, right? It's part of our mental grammar. The reference is what a word refers to. It's what it picks out in the world. And I'm gonna give some examples to illustrate this. So you see a picture on the screen, I'm sure you can tell what that is. So the question is, what does wolf mean? And I also often do this with my students in face-to-face -face lectures where I'll go through and have them brainstorm. And they'll often tell me things like, um, you know, a four-legged animal or a mammal or having, a, you know, it has a big tail, it's wild, it lives in Alaska, right? They give me lots of information. The problem as I see it is that this is not necessary and sufficient conditions for defining what a wolf is, right? We can imagine a wolf that's born without a tail. We can imagine a three-legged wolf. Um, I grew up in Montana, and when I was growing up, there were a lot of domesticated wolves. And so saying that it's wild is not part of the meaning of it for me. Um, living in Alaska, isn't a necessary condition, right? That, that we could imagine that something catastrophic could happen and there would be no more wolves in Alaska, but that wouldn't make the word meaningless. So let me pose a different question. What does Rupert Grint mean? Now, I expect that a lot of you immediately pull up an image of this person, but um, I, I also recognize that some of you may not know this name. However, I think you do know who, what, who it refers to. Uh, refers to this guy here. Rupert Grint is the actor who played Ron Weasley in the series of Harry Potter films. So my question is, as a word, Rupert Grint, what does it mean? Well, you could give me all sorts of information, like for example, um, you know, his birth date, where he was born, um, you know, that he played, uh, that he played Ron Weasley when he was X years old and so on. But I would argue that none of that is inherent to Rupert Grintness. Um, he was Rupert Grint before he ever got that role as Ron Weasley. And he's had plenty of other roles since then. These are just simply devices that we use to get at its reference. And what I want to argue is that the meaning of Rupert Grint is that individual out there in the world. That is its meaning. Its reference is its meaning. Now, I want you to think about this one. What does chair mean? Now, to me, this is a very different question than the Wolf question and the Rupert Grant question, because chairs don't exist without humans, right? This is something that we invented. And for this, I find that many students will start just describing their ideal chair. For me, the picture here is pretty close to my ideal. You know, it's a wooden dining room style chair. That's what I picture when I think of chair. But I recognize that there's all sorts of different types of chairs out there. There are metal chairs, there are tubular chairs, there are chairs made of plywood, there are chairs made of um, concrete, right? All sorts of chairs. And they have some overlapping similarities. All of them, for example, are designed to be sat in. And I recognize that there are some things that are designed to be sat in that clearly are not chairs. So for example, a stool is not a chair, right? And a couch is not a chair, right? So there are things that have that property of being sittable, but they're not chairs. 
and so to me, perhaps the way to envision what a chair is, is to imagine your perfect chair and then work away from that in kind of concentric circles to think of expanding it. and i think this is often the way that we proceed with classes like this um and eventually you're going to reach your threshold. so for example, i often ask students about beanbag chairs. is a beanbag chair a chair? and i would say ninety percent of my students say no. even though it's got chair in the word, it's not a chair. it's sort of a bridge too far. it's too far from your ideal, too far from your prototype of what a chair should be. so now i want to go through a few ways that we deal with semantics, that we deal with the meaning of words. One way is a dictionary style meaning. So in this case, we use other words to get at the meaning of a word. So for example, the dictionary, the Oxford Languages Dictionary, defines a wolf as a wild carnivorous mammal of the dog family, living and hunting in packs. It is native to both Eurasia and North America. Now, as I said, I, I do find some of that problematic. Um, I agree with it being carnivorous, although we can imagine a wolf that is a vegetarian, uh, wild, maybe in general, but there are certainly domesticated wolves that exist. Um, not all wolves live in packs. Um, and it being native to Eurasia and North America is interesting. But if we found out that there were wolves native to um africa let's say um i don't think that would change our perception it wouldn't change our language of what a wolf is on the other hand here's a, a definition for chair a separate seat for one person typically with a back and four legs i think that's pretty good um conception, I don't really have much objection to that type of dictionary style definition in terms of getting at the linguistic meaning of a word. One issue that people have with a dictionary style meaning is that it does lend itself to circularity, that how do you get at the meaning of words without talking about other words and eventually you're defining one word in, with respect to another word, and then that other word is defined with respect to the first word. So for example, dog might be defined in terms of, you know, its similarity or, or affinity to wolves and wolves with respect to dogs, right? So that's problematic, right? That's the circularity that we're talking about. Another problem is what's the starting point? If we're defining things in terms of other words, well, how did we get our first words? So one approach to that is that we consider certain words, certain meanings as primitives, atoms of language that we're in a sense born with, where we have certain primitive notions that we just have hardwired into our brains, and then all other words are built on those words. And I think that gets us around the circularity problem as well. And that sort of approach lends itself well to a feature-based semantics where we could define a wolf in terms of certain characteristics, certain features that it has, that it's plus canine, um, that it's plus wild. Uh, and being plus canine also means that it's going to be plus mammal, and plus mammal means that it's going to be plus animal and so on. So we get certain features that go together that imply other features. That's a very prominent way of doing um, lexical semantics in linguistics. Another approach is the mental image meaning, where meanings are stored as images. So for example, in that case, we could think that the meaning of wolf is just that conception that we've got in our heads of a wolf, uh, which may be very stylized even. It may not be a picture of an actual wolf, but sort of a, almost like a cartoon image. Um, for Rupert Grint, going back to that, I think my mental image of Rupert Grint is from the very first Harry Potter movie when he was um, you know, a, a preteen. And then chair, again, as I said, my perfect image of a chair is a wooden, dining room chair. These are called prototypes. These are prototypes of wolfness 
or chairness or even rupert grintness, i suppose, where i can see somehow that the the modern, the contemporary incarnation of rupert grint has some similarities to my mental image of him when he was about twelve years old. it does lend itself, though, to the problem of perspective that my mental image of a chair may be very different than your mental image of a chair or a wolf or whatever it is. Um, does that mean that we have different meanings for those words? Maybe. And then, of course, there's the issue that not all meanings lend themselves to images. So this certainly isn't something that we can apply across the board to all lexical items. Um, I would be hard pressed to have a mental image of what entropy is, for example. OK, another approach is meaning as reference, which I already brought up with respect to Rupert Grint, that a proper name really doesn't lend, himself, lend itself to sense-based meaning. Um, it, it really has as its meaning its reference. So the meaning of a proper name is the reference of the name. So Rupert Grint is that individual, not the picture of the individual, that individual out there who I've never met, never seen in person, but I trust that he exists out there in the world. And that is the meaning of Rupert Grint. Meaning for nouns, verbs, and adjectives could similarly be reference-based, i.e. the set of all things that X. So for example, wool. Uh, we could define wolf as just simply being the set of all things that are wolves. And that seems kind of odd at first, but it really does work. And it seems to be a very good way to get at the meaning of words semantically, especially once we get into compositional semantics, that that set-based approach is really useful. Another approach is through meaning relationships. Hyponymy and hypernomy, synonymy, antonymy, and there's different types of antonymy, complementary antonymy, antonymy, gradable antonymy, reverses autonomy, and converses autonomy. Let's start with hyponymy and hypernomy. This is the idea of sets and subsets. This ends up being a very useful way of defining terms. So, for example, when we talk about animals, we often think about them in terms of their relationships to other animals. So we group canines together, for example, and that in that way we know that gray wolves and dogs are very closely related um, because they share a common hypernym. So a hypernym is above the word hyponym would be below the word. So for example, dog has many hyponyms like poodle, German shepherd, Rottweiler. All right, so that's going to be hyponyms of dog. And then a hypernym of dog would be canine. And then a hypernym of canine would be mammal. And we could go on up. That's a good way to establish meaning relationships. Synonymy is another one that we need to grapple with in semantics. Um, the idea of this is that if we go back to the Saussurian sign, it's two signifiers, one signified. Languages tend to be tolerant of homophony, but very intolerant of synonymy. Most purported cases of synonymy, I argue, differ in social meaning or emotional meaning. So they have the same informational meaning, but they differ at the social meaning or me emotional meaning aspects. Antonymy, um, this is where we've got opposites, but there's different types of opposites. We'll start with complementary antonymy, and this is the definition taken from language files 12. If everything in the world is either in X's reference set or in Y's reference set, and neither of those, or in neither of those sets, but crucially not in both sets, and if stating that something is X generally implies that it isn't Y, then X and Y form a complementary pair. That's a terrible definition. It's way too convoluted, and the fact is that second if clause is redundant. So this if clause that reads, 
And if stating that something is X generally implies that it isn't Y, that's redundant. We don't need that at all. So, and furthermore, the second if clause, I think that what they intended to say was if stating that something is not X generally implies that it is Y. Now, I'm gonna give a simplified version of this definition. Hopefully this will be a little bit clearer to you. For some coherent set Z, if every member of Z is a member of X or Y, but not both X and Y, then X and Y forms a complementary pair. The term comes from mathematics, and I think it's best to envision it mathematically. So for example, um, we can talk about integers, the set of integers, that's gonna be our set Z. And then every integer is either odd or even, and never both. Right? So it's either odd or it's even if it's an integer. And so in that way, you've got this perfect division between the class. Gradable antonyms is more where you've got a scale, where the pair represent endpoints on a continuum. So hot and cold are very good examples of gradable antonyms. Reverses are where one member of the pair undoes the other member. So, for example, tie versus untie. And then there's converses, where the pair represents opposing points of view or perspectives on an event or state. One member of a pair implies the other. So thinking about um, lending and borrowing, right? If I lend you money, then you must be borrowing money from me. So those are going to be converses. Or if I give you money, then you receive the money. 